Good morning. Welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. We're going to be looking at the end of Paul's third missionary journey this morning and some of the preparations for what I refer to as his fourth missionary journey. That will be when he's taken as a prisoner on a boat to Rome. He's been wanting to go to Rome for a long time. If you'll recall, as we looked the last two or three weeks at some of the highlights in the book of Romans that he wrote, he mentioned to them that he had a great desire to come see them and to minister with them. And he's on his way back to Jerusalem. We're going to be in the section of the book of Acts from chapter 20 through uh, chapter 26. And we'll not be reading all of those verses, of course, but we'll read several verses. In chapter 20, which is the last part of his third missionary journey, people are warning him not to go to Jerusalem because of danger there of people that will cause him harm and potential persecution, possibly even death. And because of this, there are some people in our uh, uh, Bible studies today that believe that Paul was out of God's will by going to Jerusalem because we read in some of those verses in chapter 20 and 21 that people warned him even uh, with the appearance that they were being uh, influenced by the Holy Spirit to warn him of the danger that would be in Jerusalem. My opinion is that I don't agree with them in thinking that he was out of God's will. My opinion is that he was still in God's will and that the reason he was going there was to not only say uh, hello and greet the people at the church in Jerusalem, but also to deliver a love offering that he had made a commitment to take for the poor saints in Jerusalem in all of his missionary journeys. And he was on his way back there to deliver that. So I'll begin reading at uh, verse 17 of actually Acts chapter 21. When he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Remember that Acts is written by Luke. So sometimes when we read like this, where it says the brethren received us gladly, it is as if uh, Luke is writing that and he was with Paul. So when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James. That would be the half-brother of Jesus. And all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles throughout his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So here was a group of believers that welcomed Paul in Jerusalem. And the next day we read that he also went to another group that included James, which I believe we could almost ascertain that he had become the main ruler or elder of the church in Jerusalem. And in addition to James, uh, the Lord's half-brother, there were other elders of the church in Jerusalem that met him there. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, meaning they've trusted in Christ as their Messiah. And they are all zealous for the law. So these are Jews that have trusted in Christ, but they're still zealous in keeping the Mosaic law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have here four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, 
and from sexual immorality. So at this point, we see that these elders and James um, reveal a little bit more about their thoughts about the believing Jews and the law. It sounds as if they were still in favor of Jews who had trusted in Christ, still observing the Mosaic law. And of course, we have read many times, especially in the book of Galatians and the book of Romans that Paul wrote, how that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. So it sounds like they want Paul to show that he still kept the law and those ceremonial practices, even though they had agreed that the believing Gentiles didn't have to do that. And so it even touches on some of the things that was mentioned in that letter that came from James and the other uh, leaders of the church in Jerusalem that we read about way back in Acts chapter 15, and that also Paul alluded to in chapter 2 of the book of Galatians. So there's a, a bit of a question here as to whether they have gone back to some of their old practices or if they never completely uh, got away from the Mosaic law. And so Paul is going to acquiesce, so to speak, to their uh, request or uh, influence for him to join these four guys that have taken a vow and to pay their expenses that would cover the ceremonies that would take place when the vow time came to an end and they would shave their head and go through those ceremonial things. And so I find it a little bit interesting that Paul even agreed to do this. So now I'll read from chapter 27 and beyond in Acts chapter 21. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, which means Asia Minor, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place, referring to the temple. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So these Jews are Jews from Asia Minor, possibly even from the area of Ephesus, since they recognized this Ephesian named Trophimus that they had seen there in the city with Paul. And they mistakenly took for granted that Paul had brought him into the temple area, which we don't read that he had ever done. So we don't know whether they were believers in Christ, Christ followers or not. But what we do know is that whether they were or they weren't, they were still very zealous about keeping the law and observing it, and that they were seemingly pretty prejudiced against the Gentiles. So now I'll read from verse 30. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison uh, that Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried out one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. So we would anticipate that those who wanted to kill Paul were not believers because they certainly weren't showing the love of Christ that they should have learned had they become Christ followers. And what we see here is that God is not finished with Paul and God provided the Roman soldiers to show up just at the right time uh, to keep him from being killed by the mob. So we move to verse 37 of Acts chapter 21. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? 
He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? So he was mistaken about who Paul was. But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. Tarsus was an area that was in a Roman province. Rome was the ruling empire at the time. And because of that, and him having come from there, being born there, he had a dual citizenship, if you will recall. He was certainly a Jewish citizen, but he was also a Roman citizen because of having been born in that province. In verse 40 says, So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. So here we see that Paul spoke Greek to this Roman, and now he turns to address the crowd, and because they are Jews, he speaks in the Hebrew language to them. And so now we come to chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received certain letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So he's going all the way back to when he was a Pharisee and had permission by the high priest to go to Damascus and bring back people that were following the way, which is what they referred to Christians as at that time. They hadn't yet been referred to as Christians. They were people of the way. And normally when we read that in an English translation, way is normally capitalized. And so he's beginning there and giving his testimony. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone round about me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke with me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed to you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, remember that it caused them to be blind for a period, being led by the hand by those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked upon him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one. And there in my translation, just and one are capitalized, meaning that the translators understood that to be a reference of Jesus Christ himself. And to hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witnesses to all men of what you have seen and heard. <clears throat> and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized to wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance <clears throat> and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in... Uh, Every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also stood standing and consenting to his death and that guarding the clothes of even those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him up into this word when he mentioned Gentiles. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. Then as they cried out, 
and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks <clears throat> and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why he shouted so against him. So here we see more evidence that the people in the mob were not followers of Christ. And in addition to not being loving, they were still quite prejudiced against the Gentiles. And when Paul mentioned Gentiles, they started their uproar again. One of the things that we can take away from this portion of the passage is how Paul gave his testimony. We can share our testimony with people also to explain the convictions that we have, the biblical worldview that we have, and the hope that we have because of what Christ has done for us. That's what Paul did when he was giving his testimony. And that's what you and I can do on a daily basis when we come across people that need to hear about the love of Christ, share with them what he's done for us. So you're probably familiar with the rest of the story, how it goes from here. Paul was arrested, <clears throat> and because he uh, revealed to the Roman uh, centurion and to the, the guards there that he indeed was also a Roman citizen, he was then given a preferred treatment as a prisoner from that time going forward. And we'll skip over some of the chapters and verses that get to, so we can get to Paul's testimony before some of the Roman officials, because he was actually imprisoned there in Caesarea for over two years before he gets to embark on his fourth missionary journey as a prisoner on his way to Rome. So after two years, <clears throat> well, first, he had the opportunity to speak before Felix, the governor, and his wife but he wasn't set free. Felix had even hoped that Paul would give him bribe money to set him free, but of course he didn't do that. And two years passed by, and then Festus became the governor and followed after Felix. And Paul was brought before him, and there were Jews from Jerusalem who testified against Paul there. And when Festus heard that uh, Paul gave his testimony and heard the testimony accusing him of things that were unjust by those Jews that had come to testify against him, Festus asked Paul if he'd be willing to go to Jerusalem for standing trial there. But Paul, understanding that they wanted to kill him and that would probably happen along the way if he agreed to go there, instead then he appealed to go to Caesar. And Caesar being the head of the Roman government that was at Rome. And so that left Paul in prison in Caesarea for some additional time. And the next thing that comes along in the narrative was when King Agrippa and his wife Bernice came to uh, Israel. And uh, Festus took the opportunity to bring Paul before Festus. It served as an opportunity for Festus to heal up some ill feelings between him and King Agrippa. It also served as an opportunity, he hoped, that King Agrippa would give some type of statement that he could put on the papers that would follow a prisoner that would be an explanation of why they were incarcerated and what they were being accused of. So we come to chapter 26 of Acts, and we're going to look at Paul's testimony before King Agrippa. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused of the Jews, especially because you are expert in all the customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, that of being a Pharisee, I lived a Pharisee, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain, which is eternal life with the Father. 
For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible to you that God would raise the dead? Remember that way back when Paul had been uh, accused by the mob, he mentioned that one of the things that he was being called on the carpet for was because he was preaching about the resurrection. And he knew that that mob was made up of both Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The, the Sadducees did not. So he was aware of that. And so he referred to that as one of the tenets of his messages, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is absolutely necessary. It's part of the gospel that Paul explained in the first four verses of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that the gospel was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he said, For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were, uh, when they were put to death. I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every lang in synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities, referring to that time that he was on his way to Damascus. So Paul was giving his testimony, and he was being very honest and straightforward about the things that he used to do that were contrary to following Christ. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So a tremendous testimony that Paul is giving and will continue with him. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses uh, said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he made this defense of himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you were almost persuading me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I wish to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might both become almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. 
So we come to the end of the passages that we're going to read today. And, uh, well, I guess I'll read a couple of more here in just a second. But what we see is that God gives opportunity to Paul to give his testimony to anyone that would listen, whether they were poor people, sick people, dying people, all the way up to the king. So remember that way back in chapter 9 of Acts, there was a man named Ananias that Paul even referenced earlier in his testimony that had been commissioned by God to go and lay hands on Paul that he might receive his sight after Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And in addition to laying hands on him that he might receive his sight, he also was given some information about Paul when he questioned God, do you really want me to go see that guy? I've heard many things about him and they're not good. And so I'm going to read verses 15 and 16 of Acts chapter 9. That is what the Lord said to Ananias that gives us information about Paul. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God is fulfilling his plan and purpose for Paul in his service to the Lord. It's an example of how oftentimes we might have an idea how God will or should use us in serving him only to find out that God accomplishes his purpose through us in ways that might be quite different than what we had thought would happen. And so as we approach what I believe to be the end of our age and the soon return of the Lord, remember one of the things that the Apostle Paul told his apprentice, Timothy, for all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And it appears that in the day in which you and I are living, persecution is headed our direction. What we want to take from what we've read today about the Apostle Paul and his testimonies is that God will give us opportunity to share our testimony, even in situations that we might think are not only uncomfortable, but times of persecution. And so the easiest way for us to share the gospel and the love of Christ with someone is just tell people what Jesus has done for us. We can certainly tell them that Christ died for us on the cross and that his blood was shed there for the payment of our sins. But don't leave him on the cross in your giving of your testimony. Make sure that you tell them that God was satisfied with his sacrificial, sacrificial death on our behalf. And to show his satisfaction, he raised him from the dead. And he's now alive and even sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, never to suffer death again. And he serves there as our high priest. And one day he's coming back. And uh, so when we give our testimony of what Christ has done for us, like what Paul has done in the passages that we read, or have read, uh, that's an example of how we can serve the Lord. We don't have to have tons and tons of scripture memorized, although if you do memorize scripture, it will help you in sharing your testimony. But just look for an opportunity to share the love of Christ and what he's done for you. Next week, we'll be joining Paul on his fourth missionary journey. He'll finally get to go on his way to Rome. The only thing is he'll be in chains as a prisoner and he'll be on a ship. But as we follow him along that fourth missionary journey, we'll see time after time that God gives him opportunity to witness to prisoners, to Roman soldiers, even to a king over an area on an island called Malta as he makes his way in God's plan of things to finally make it to Rome. So if you'd like to read ahead, chapters 27 and 28 of Acts is where we'll be to start with next week. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given. Thank you for those who join us online. 
I pray that your blessings be upon them. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Again, I apologize for the clocks. That means that I normally sit here and try to work in the videos before the clocks get to do their thing, which means I talk too long again. <laughs> Hope that you have a good Lord's Day this weekend. If you have a chance, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit again on Saturday afternoon. Until the next time we see you, Lord bless you.